my nutsack while I'm outside. Yeah, I do not have neighbors, so that's the only reason I do it. Yeah, but nature is your neighbor. <laughs> yeah, I'll let the birds see my bird. Yeah. Yeah. You know I like saying? that out of out of that whole phrase, the one thing that you wanted to dispute was whether or not you had neighbors. Like that was what you picked out. <laughs> that was, that's solid. Welcome back to Another Side Lifestyle <laughs> Podcast with Jim and Aram. Today, get ready for the cool, sultry, sexy sound of J.K. McLeod's voice. Be sure to check him out on all streaming platforms with the Help Me Understand podcast, as well as the Lifting, Running, and Living with Kelly and JK. You can also follow him on Wadwell for Metcon style workouts. <sighs> wow, that was has, really professional. Yeah. It was. Wow. This guy has a sexy voice. The last time I talked to JK, he said, is it possible for us to get together and hang out and talk and not have a deep conversation? And apparently it is not <laughs> for me and JK. <laughs> Yeah, unless today we we break the streak, but I, I got a feeling, I got a feeling it may not happen. I don't know. We you will... see, you, you see the journey that Jimmy's on right now. It's very deep. He's like the fucking Mariana's trench right now. J.K. That... knows what's up. He yeah. knows the secrets that the listeners don't know about me. Absolutely. We try to any any time we've interacted, we try to keep it like surface level for about seven seconds. Yeah, and then. <laughs> No matter, no matter what, without even trying, all of a sudden we're we're like layers deep. <laughs> so I don't know. Sometimes you just vibe with people, right? So yeah. he's an he's an onion that doesn't make me cry. Mm. Wow, Jake, That's, I, will, I will say this: one liners this is, are crazy. I was thinking about this earlier today. This is how I know J.K. is one of my people. He is a no show sock wearing, van style shoe wearing. Oh mid, shit! Mid thigh short wearing. Oh heck yeah! Sexy beast. What are you from yeah. LA? No, <laughs> Far from Midwest. That's Far how that's from. how everybody out here dresses, man. That's how that's like yeah. SoCal. That's like SoCal to the day. So yeah, no show socks from. is SoCal. Yeah. Oh yeah. So it's bands fun. or or you have the other side, like the cholo side with like the white socks that go up like mid mid calf yeah. with the longer shorts. So you have like both yes. styles. Yeah. When I was living in San Diego twenty five years ago. That was the first time I saw like high socks outside of my early '80s childhood. Yeah, that's hilarious. Exactly what you just said. Outside, uh, off the basketball court. It was just <laughs> anywhere. Everyone's wearing the high. So I can't do the high socks. J.K., have you ever worn high socks outside of the '80s? Uh, I went through. Yeah, when I was <laughs> when I was going through my my CrossFit primarily about like 70% of my training phase. Yeah. Cause I was year, in that. What year was that? Early two thousands, mid two thousands. Uh, you, you were just, you were just preventing mid. your shins, shins from bleeding probably. <laughs> yeah. 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 Mid let's call it like mid two thousands. It's when, you know, every CrossFitter had a, a pink pair of barbells for boobs, socks, of course. And, you know, of all that, course. Thanks all for that tuning jazz in to this week of other side lifestyle podcast. That was JK. We'll see you next time. <laughs> <laughs> and scene <laughs> yeah so other oh, I, than that no yeah. other than that no yeah i got a i got a good one to break the ice on this one today oh All boy right. so yesterday in my stories i posted that i was gonna lower prices guys the amount of fucking panic on instagram like i had coaches dming me like oh you know you should really charge what you're worth and you're one of the best out there and if you lower prices then that's gonna make everybody else have to lower prices i'm like good that's going to make everybody else have to lower like, price. Good, because my, some of you motherfuckers don't even, aren't even worth half of what you charge. Yeah, that is so wild. just let them know that you did discover your value and it's not what you were charging. You're, well, I just, I, this whole idea, you thought. <laughs> this whole idea of like get paid what you're worth and like, you know what we're worth? We're worth what somebody's willing to pay us. That's what the fuck Correct. we're worth. And at so the I end of the day, you. what? I was going to say, I teach Hendrix that. Yeah. Like how, the, how much is how much is something worth? How much somebody somebody's willing to pay? How much is your house worth? However much somebody's willing to pay. How much is yeah, that I, baseball card worth? However much somebody's willing to pay. Obviously, we have comps and we have we have market value and all that kind of shit, which I get. But like, there's also ranges, right? Like, if market value is two hundred to five hundred, why do you have to go five hundred? Like, doesn't that price people out? 
Because for me, I don't have to do all that much work to service a client. I have a very good system in place. I have high expectations. I set. Everything is clear. Everybody knows what their fucking role is. And it's good. But there's there's this like massive fear that goes on. It's like, oh my God, you're lowering prices. Like, yeah. Because A, we're in a fucking slump. People are struggling. People still need help. So why are we going to price gouge people and make it inaccessible to the masses when the masses are who we have to help? Okay, I've got a... I got a question then as somebody who didn't um, didn't see that story. What's the what's the context on adjusting the pricing? I mean, for two reasons, a because I could do it for less and it doesn't take anything out away from me. Okay. And it makes it that much more attractive for people to be able to buy my services because it makes it that much more affordable. And the whole idea here is we're trying to develop long term relationships with clients because the longer they stay in your ecosystem for the greater their potential for their results. So if you charge some dumb fucking number or you charge somebody for six months ahead of time and, you know, you'd give them dick in, after six months, then I don't think I, you should ever give your clients dick. That's well, inappropriate and it's unprofessional. I try to give as little dick as possible because that's really all I have. That is all you have. I was it say. is. It's very, very <laughs> little. He but gives pri- just pri- a tip, a.k.a. Price, the whole thing. Priced accordingly. <laughs> Yeah, I think you just charge whatever you want, whatever you right. feel comfortable with. But, it, yeah. but it's just amazing to see the outpour of like bigger coaching people. Like, I mean, there was people that would be having me that had like hundreds of thousands of followers. And they're like, well, you know. And I'm like, no, I don't know. Why don't you educate me? And I'm getting like That's- paragraphs from people like telling me like I should be charging more. It's like, first of all, why? Like, what am I, what am I doing? Really? I'm giving you a workout program that you can literally get online for free. I'm giving you macros, which you can also get online for free. And I'm giving you my time and my availability, which I sit around my house waiting for you to call me. And you still don't. Your life sounds horrible. Like, what Like what the fuck am I going to... I'm going to charge you $5,000 for six months for that? Yeah. It just doesn't make any fucking sense to me. Now, okay. Follow up on that. Is this Is this somewhat partly based on or you know what percentage is this based on you having conversations with people and they like straight up the price is the barrier like it just comes down to that is the barrier i don't know that the price is the barrier to start i think the price is the barrier to continue and i don't care about starting i don't i don't want to have a whole i don't want to i don't want a revolving door of business coming in and out for two or three months at a time so then maybe after three six months the price drops which is fine. And I also have that as an option as well. I have a maintenance program to where after people graduate and they earn some autonomy and they still need the guidance and the accountability, but they're just uh-huh. using me less. They drop down to a lower price, which is fine. That's already been baked in for a while. But I think for a lot of people, a lot of the times they're hesitant to start, A, because they know that there's a price tag attached to it and they don't trust themselves to do the work. So for them, it's not going to be worth it. So Interesting. lower lower the barrier, lower the obstacle, encourage them to start, encourage them to get going. And then once they start to get into the flow of things and things aren't beating them up financially, which is another stressor for them on top of all the other shit they have to deal with when you're asking them to make habit changes. Well, now you have somebody who's actually getting the work done and they're actually starting to feel better and more confident. And they'll probably stay in the ecosystem for longer anyway. So it's a longer term, better business call anyway, in my opinion. Yeah. I mean, I... I can't argue. I can't argue with that. That that reaction that you're getting from other coaches, it, it that's kind of wild to me. Like one, I don't, I don't want to exert that sort of energy anybody. to other people. <laughs> I, I, well, I, I was going to say, what's it like? What's it like getting people to reach out to you? Around? I think what's I think what's <laughs> happening is that people. It's cool because I'm at a point in my career where people actually value my opinion, and they're seeing like, oh, well, one of the better coaches in the industry is dropping his prices. Why? It maybe it's maybe it's a mirror on their own on their own systems and how they yeah. maybe feel like they're charging too much and they shouldn't. And they feel like it's going to start to put a constraint on their income. But I mean, I know coaches that are making 40, $50,000 a month and it's like, okay, that's awesome. That's great. I don't have that appetite, nor do I want to have all the bullshit and the multiple assistant coaches. And like, yeah. I want to deal with people myself. I want to have people like me and Jimmy are very similar when it comes to this. Like I want my people directly connected to me and I will, give them whatever they need from me and for as long as they could possibly do it for, because that's what this is all about. It's about support and being there for people. Because at the end of the day, like I said, all the X's and O's, all the black and white shit, they can Google all that tomorrow. They can chat GPT their way into fitness if they really wanted to, but what's, who's going to hold them accountable? Who's going to be there for them on Friday nights when they're having a panic attack in front of the peanut butter jar? 
And I am. I will not I be am. there on Friday night. And that's what I separates will, me from everybody. I will abandon you. I will abandon you and then see how you did on your own. Well, that's why I'm one of the best coaches in the industry. It's debatable. Um, JK. No, it's a, it's a, it's a fact. <laughs> it's a fact. I'll stamp it. And I do it for $298 a month. When I, I, I want to throw one thing in there. So this Please. is this is super cool that you've shared that because from my perspective, what that says, there's like a parallel with um, how Walmart, I didn't just call you Walmart, but you could, I love Walmart. So there's a parallel there with how Walmart basically controls the retail industry. And I'm somebody who not only works full-time in fitness, I work full-time in the retail industry too. So I've, I've I did not know that about you. Yeah. I've worked in the retail industry for coming up on 30 years at this Holy point. Holy shit in some way, shape or form. And so before Black Friday was a thing, before stores opening on Thanksgiving was a thing, like pretty much within the retail industry, um, malls, big box stores, they shift and move de- based specifically based on what Walmart decides to do. So they're, so like, the mar- they're like the market you know, mover? 100%, 100%, really? like for a fact. So it's very interesting that you announce this particular move and you have these other entities then reaching out to you who may seem like on the external from a financial standpoint, maybe they're a bigger mover from a revenue standpoint, maybe not profit, but revenue standpoint, they might be bigger. And they're telling you that what you just announced, they're seeing as potentially a threat to their business. That's it, That says something about the impact Every, that you have on the industry. Yeah, because yeah, a lot of your I, stuff really resonates, you know what I mean? So I think I just, I just hope it's <laughs> positive, man. Like I just hope at the end of the day, like it, well, we clearly it need, is. We don't need to constrain these people. Like it's it's a it's such a hard decision to make. And I'll be honest, everybody's always like, Well, if you're a coach, you should believe in coaching. And I do. I do. Mm-hmm. I believe in mentorship, I believe in coaching, I believe in having somebody as a person to spitball ideas with to confide in and luckily for me i'm connected to so many of you guys that are so good at what you do that i can always have those conversations and they don't cost me anything other than time but i think the problem is is that there's such a paywall around what we do now and there's so many people that are doing at such astronomical rates and it's because there's this magical promise of something different than what somebody else has when in reality the good ones are all saying the same shit we say it with our own voice in our own unique way our protocols are probably going to be based from the same textbook anyway. So the only thing that differs you from me, from Jimmy, is the way that we deliver our information and how we actually interact with our clientele base. And that makes us either a good fit for them or it doesn't. But again, I don't think that needs to disqualify the masses from getting the help that they need. Well said. Well, and beard thickness kind of differentiates. Well, you you went in that department that's all cool. day long. If I had your beard, I, if I had your beard, I would charge 500 a month. Thank you for the business advice. I just I would. took that. If I, Thanks. I don't charge five hundred. Well, months, so. well, you have you have beard product to buy. I get it. Like your cost of living is higher than mine. That's totally. Fair. <laughs> that is totally fair. So if my clients hear this and then they they reach out and they're like, "Hey, are you lowering yours?" I'm like, "Have you seen this beard? I can't oh, yeah. afford to lower They'll be prices. fine. They'll be like, "You know what, J.K. You're absolutely yeah. right. It's warranted. We will pay you more. Yeah. We know beard oil is not cheap." You think yeah. Johnny Slicks is free? <laughs> no, it's really the secret is coconut oil, fellas. Is it really? Just a heads up. Not even joking. Yeah, I really? use some beard products, but really coconut oil. Yeah, that's what really like really fueled the the. Does that promote the growth. the growth or just like the look of it? Uh, to my understanding, a bit of both, and really? it might okay. even be placebo well, at this point. But I'm going to be honest with you. Like I, I'm like I'm digging it. Yeah, you like it. Yeah, right, well, yeah. it's not doing anything. You like it. I'm yeah, swimming in coconut oil for the next month. It is wild how different we all look when we have beards or don't have beards. I know. Like when I, I see know. a picture of JK with no beard, oh, like dude. who the fuck is that guy? <laughs> Can we pull one up? Do we have one? Do we have one on file somewhere? Yeah, uh, I'm gonna pull it. it's on the screen right now. Share your screen. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to put that in uh, post-production. Actually, no we're Lord. not. So <laughs> yeah. all right. anyway, so JK, we you had some topics that I thought were... You did really good. Okay, that, you, that that have been trying to pull it out right now. Things that you're thinking about. Um, so the one was that you do tend. I feel like most coaches probably, unless you're a male only coach, which maybe one day 
I'll become. Um, what do you mean? Like only <laughs> take male, attraction. only take male clients. Maybe one day. With you will never be a male only coach. Absolutely yeah. zero, zero percent chance you will ever That's, be a male. You, you know coach. nothing about me. And I know everything journey, about you. And the journey that I'm on. Not going to happen. Listen, I, <laughs> you fundamentally I, don't like men as much as you like women. Which is the, the new chapter, the new challenge for me. I, I do feel like oh. it's harder for me to connect with, with most men. That's why I with appreciate dudes. the male friendships that I have. That's because you have productive mm. masculinity. I'm very much in my feminine. Um, so, it's fair. JK, you, you tend to attract female clients who are high achievers. All right. Yeah. Finding their zone of training maintenance, both with frequency and volume, can be a challenge because they're driven by being seen as the person who does it all. I feel like we've all kind of had people like that. You tend to get a decent amount of people like that. And yeah. this is, I think, a huge challenge for men and women. But we've discussed it before on here. Women tend to feel like they have to take everything on. It's like that that motherly instinct like they want to take care of the kids they want to take care of this they want to they got to do it all they got to present this image um i mean you just watch tv shows like the dad's always out of shape and the mom's yeah. always in shape you know and that narrative <laughs> ha that narrative hasn't died yet it's very odd like that's no. been going on for 30 40 years plus and it's yeah. never gone away and it's like in real life too you see it a lot and it's almost yeah. rare when you see like a uh the the husband or the man like in really good shape and the woman not it's just more rare, but you, yeah. you do see it the other way around a lot. So what's that, what's that challenge like working with people like that in general? Yeah. So in general, um, first I would say, well, I mean, I, I dig it. I love it. It's, um, it's something that keeps me engaged because even when you talked about, you know, potentially someday in the future, switching over to an all male clientele, which one day you're going to unpack that. And that'll be an interesting episode that I'll listen to. Um, I enjoy the, the challenge because like many coaches, I enjoy helping the people that I think I most identify with or have identified with at some point in my life. Like that person who was uh, mostly rewarded for externally, like what they accomplished and then that mindset of like, go, go, go more, more, more. And you never really worried about anything because you figured, hey, I'll just work harder. I'll just make more money. I'll just do more things. Um, I would say that from the jump, one of the most challenging things is helping that client identify that that's actually who they are. Like they are, that they actually fit within that particular column. Like like right owning, now. like owning that distinction, like you actually are a very yeah. much overachiever versus, or high achiever. Yeah. Like versus yes. feeling like a victim to it. Like, what's wrong with me? Why? Yeah, do I feel this way all the time. Yeah, um, you know, there. Uh, I'll, I'll just. I'm gonna. I know that I'm just gonna default to primarily speaking about like female clientele, just because that's over 95 percent of who i've worked we were, with we over were time. considering changing the name of our podcast to mansplaining oh, to yeah be legit so we I'm, love I'm, I'm the king of that we love yeah we love okay. mansplaining, uh, which is just a man talking about anything that they recognize in women at all That's just yeah that. so um yeah i think where the where the challenge comes in first helping that client understand like where they actually are is that they they typically are not big on like they hate being labeled. Um, I can also relate to that. They hate being like fit into some sort of a category or into a box. And where I immediately am starting to do the work is trying to flip it from, Hey, I'm pretty sure that the previous experiences that you've had with coaching or anything along the lines of not just fitness coaching, but even if you are in the world of business and you've been coached by a manager or anything like that, and they did personality assessments and they did um, like the Q12 and all these different things, you are probably used to, as soon as you're identified as something, then they place it as a box around you. And so, okay, you're in the higher achiever box. So that means these are the things that you must do. You're in the high achiever, the overproducer box, the you know, I'm motivated by doing more, more, more. So that means you must do these things. Like it's a box to fit within. 
And I try to set the expectation and really it takes a while to do this. So this is not like, Hey, we had one call and we're now you get it. It takes a while to build that trust level for that client to understand what I'm doing is I'm trying to identify that box is not something to fit you in, but a foundation for you to stand on top of and understand like, Hey, right now, this is the foundation that we have to build on top of, not this is what we're building around you. So there's no shame. Yeah. There's no shame that I'm trying to intentionally bring to you by saying, Hey, you're somebody who feels like the more I do, the better results that I get. And I'm specifically talking when it comes to training, like I typically attract like volume junkies. Like if I tell them, hey, I'm going to need you to go from four to now six days per week of training. I'm going to need you to go from two cardio sessions to five. They will find a way to get it done. However, try and do the opposite and start them (laughs) off with, hey, instead of the six days, I can get this done in four. They're like, well, you know, the the. Is that enough? There's no is that really yeah. enough to, yeah, to make enough. results? So, so how do you handle that? Yeah. How do you yeah, walk so f- them through that <laughs> process where yeah. you're supporting that go getter, high achiever thing, but you're telling them to do less? Because I think this is huge for a lot of people that are listening. Yeah. So first, I don't tell them to do less. Um, I am very, even with the way that I speak from, from the feedback that I've gotten, I am very methodical, like super methodical. Um, borderline to some people, probably kind of boring with my tone and everything. So I, I don't start sexy off. as fuck. I think well, it's nurturing. I, I think it's, I, I think it's nurturing and calming. I could never have well, my take mouth it. that close to the microphone. Mine has to be like two feet away. I have to be very far from the microphone. Yeah. So because of, um, of all that toxic masculinity pouring out of me. Very room. much. Yeah. <laughs> well, keep in mind, I've, I've got the toxic. beard. I've got the beard. that's like a built-in pop filter too. So, <laughs> yeah, it's a built-in pop filter. So I, um, I start by, um, how do I phrase it? I start by not just meeting the person where they are. I, I meet them where they're actually willing to be met. And what I mean by that is as a coach, I can see like within the first couple of weeks, we typically have like seen some version of this movie before. So we have a general idea of, hey, this is going to be a good place to start. However, if the client doesn't agree, like if she doesn't actually see herself there, then I'm immediately coming up against a force of trying to convince you into something. And this is where like my background in sales and things like that comes into play because I'm not here to convince you to buy a particular product. I want to get a better understanding of why you actually think you need this thing. And then I'll figure out if it's the right fit for you. So for example, I'm recently uh, worked with, or I'm still working with this client. I recently um, had someone who, when she first came to me was working out, or self-reported working out six days per week. And I would say doing no less, no less than about 40 sets of the five like major muscle groups per 40 sets per per week, per muscle group per week. Wow. Wow. 40. Yeah. And that's a lot. That's a buttload of volume, right? It's a lot lot of volume. volume. Yeah. Plus times the amount. Yeah. So, (laughs) I could, <laughs> yeah, I could, because I'm like, there's no way that that's effective. There's no way. So it's I could four immediately. Times as effective, JK. Yeah. Yeah. No. Exactly. It's, and it's, I've it's been re- there. It's, it's really effective if you're on five I use a growth hormone and 600 milligrams of test. Yeah. Yeah. And she's because, all natural too. Like because natural. you can recover from that. But us lay people, no shot. Right. Yeah. So uh, I strategically started off with, uh, you know, I could. I could immediately start off with the uh, attacking the frequency, the volume or both or whatnot. So I strategically said like, hey, you know, it seems like uh, being at the gym somewhere around five to six days a week is something that you enjoy based on the lifestyle that she has. She has like her gym people, her gym culture and things like that. So I said, here's what I want to do. Um, and I basically wrote her a program very similar to what she was following. And I said, what we're going to do is we're going to go through an assessment period. I go through like the four stages. So during the assessment period, I said for the first about three to four weeks, we can actually keep up the same amount of frequency. I'm going to cut back on the number of sets that you're doing. But what I want to do is instead of doing, let's say like five sets of this particular movement, 
I want you to do two sets, two to three sets that are a bit lighter. Like that first set, just make sure you know how you feel. Second set, I want you to add a little bit more weight. Third set, add a little bit more, but you're not really working all that hard quite yet. By the time you get to like that, that fourth set, I want you to really like lock in balls to the wall and like, let's push it and let's do that for two sets. So essentially all that I did was just re basically reprogrammed how she was thinking about things to then start introducing ramp up sets, warm up sets, feeler sets, yep. which yep. we would encourage, or I at least, and I'm pretty sure you guys would encourage people not to just go straight in and like, okay, I'm going for going for 90% of my one rep without a warm up, no ramp up, no feeler, <laughs> that sort of a thing. And she wasn't doing any of those things. She was doing five sets so that she could say like, Hey, I did five sets of 20. Yeah. Just and as much work as humanly possible to justify yeah. that because the, the vision yep. there is more work, more outcome. Very much so. So then after I want to say it didn't even take three weeks, I think it was a week and a half. Um, first she was like, Holy soreness like way more sore than I've been before. And I was like, huh, that's, that's kind of interesting. So you're, you're experiencing like some kind of different, different feelings than you've had before. And you're doing like really like less, less sets overall. It's like, yeah, it's weird how that works. And so what happens is that then opens up the conversation to then, okay, well, if we could do that, what do you think if, and then that's when now she's on four, actually she's on three days a week now. Wow. What and a that's reduction. Within, Holy shit. That's in a two and a half month period. So the key feel, there how do you was meeting her. How you feel being a manipulator of, of females? <laughs> <laughs> no Do not comment. trust this man. <laughs> no he will comment. provide you with more free time and greater results. He's manipulating yeah. you. He's making I mean, you I'm very open. <laughs> I'm very open um, with I'm very open with my clients right from the jump. And I let them know even when they come to me and they say, hey, I'll do whatever you tell me to do, I immediately let them know, hey, within the first two to three weeks during this assessment period, period, you're not necessarily going to feel like you're getting a whole lot of specific, way different direction from me. You're going to feel like, JK, I kind of feel like I'm doing what I've been doing. You're just maybe asking me more questions about like why I'm doing it, or you want to know how I feel. I have them leave notes in their, their training logs and different things like that. Cause I go through four phases. There's assessment, then there's awareness, action, and then alignment. So I let them know this is not going to be some sort of a program where within the first couple of weeks, you're going to be like, oh my gosh, two weeks later, I'm snatched and I'm ready for like my summer girl era. Like you're not going to feel like that. So you're going to feel like this is a slow start and that's on purpose because what you tell me during our first conversation, you're telling me what you think from your point of view. Mm -hmm. If you decide that we're a good fit and you want to work together, then that's fantastic. Like it's a two way thing. And then as you start, you start, start going, that's when I'm going to start to get an understanding of what's actually going on. It's like getting a job yeah. and then, you know, like you feel a little bit more solid in your position. So then your 15 minute break turns into like the 25, like you've always been, you don't show up 15 minutes early. You show up five minutes late. Like you always have, like, I, I want to work with that person. I want to work with the real you and through just the normal course of human behavior. Most people don't, it, most of the people that I've worked with don't show up as their authentic self right on day one, Never. it takes a couple of weeks for them to trust that they can actually be who they are. And then yeah. that's when the work really starts rolling. Yeah. And, and I'm like cool a, with that. Yeah. And that's, I, 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 that's a whole different process and a whole different journey of yeah. people figuring out who they are. I mean, yeah. this is, it's like, I mean, I did <laughs> what you were describing, like working, doing all this stuff. I feel like I've done that for so many years. And now I'm at the point where I'm like, I just want less you know i just want to enjoy and be and all that where before it was like don't just be do now i'm like i just want to be you know but it's it's wild how all those things can change and that's just a whole different process so it's that's what's awesome about what you're doing and what coaches that care about people do is i've, I've said from the beginning it's always more than nutrition it's always yeah. it's, it's like figuring out yourself through the process of treating yourself well through training, through nutrition, well, and then learning 
who you are, which is the coolest thing to see when people have those yeah. revelations. So I think something that's definitely worth mentioning there that you, I'm glad that you brought up was just even in your own journey as you're evolving to a place where you're, you're looking to essentially do less. And sometimes people hear that, especially with the crowd that I work with, when they hear less, they're, they're not thinking, um, I don't, if you guys are familiar with Greg McEwen, the book essentialism, so he has a book called essentialism. I've, I read I've, it a I've, few, I few years see the ago cover in my head. Yeah. It's like a, I think it yeah. looks like a whole tangled, like mess of yes. whatever. Yeah. yeah. So it's like essentialism, the disciplined art of doing less or something yeah. like that. And for very high achievers, um, doing less feels like basically you're doing nothing. Yeah. And being able to find like that middle of the road is very, very difficult sometimes. Yep. So I think that as the process evolves, the folks who typically find themselves understanding that they want to do less, what they're, what I feel like they're really saying is I want to make sure that I'm giving everything I can to purely only the things that actually need to be done. Yes. Like I want to spend the amount of time in the gym that I really need to spend in order to be effective. I'm no longer down <laughs> with like 80% of my gym session being fluff or, you know, junk yeah. volume and all that stuff, because nine times out of 10, there are things happening outside of the gym that you're realizing that thing that you, you know, eloquently called a trade off two years ago. Now, are you ready to really call it a sacrifice? Because that's what it is. Like I'm, I'm somebody who personally has now developed an issue with the like, the word trade off. So I'm like, it's just a friendly way to tell people that it's a sacrifice. So are you currently willing to sacrifice? Um, are you willing to sacrifice your sleep so that you can get up at two o'clock in the morning and do a workout? Is that really worth it to you? Are you willing to sacrifice picking your kids up from school? Is that really worth it to you? And it no longer is, and they're realizing that. So that's, that's kind of where that evolution starts. That's yeah, a great, so that's the phrase it's evolution. And I think the evolution uh, thing yeah. comes with training age and it comes with the longer you spend mm -hmm paying attention to nutrition, the longer you spend building and keeping these habits in place, you start to not only achieve what you've always wanted to achieve, because just we all know consistency over time is what creates results. But mentally, you just get into such a better and more comfortable place to where like, if you have that meal that you weren't really proud of, it doesn't fucking matter. If you have a shit workout, or you don't go that day, you find another way to move your body that's just as as fulfilling to you. So the problem is, is because our clients hire us in very often very vulnerable states, mm. there's this need to accelerate the process. And I think what's really interesting about the way that you approach it is it's a very similar way that I do it. I just don't have the same verbiage to it. The first four to six weeks is, is my time to figure out at what point is life going to punch you in the face in these next few weeks? Because <laughs> I want to see what happens when life really just kicks you in the nuts. And then like, how do you respond to it? Are you going to, because right now you're fired up, you paid, you got your plan, you're ready to rock and roll, you're excited, but yeah. that's all going to end in a couple of days when your fucking dog shits on the carpet and your kid's sick and your you and your husband are in a fight and work sucks and you've had to work until nine that night instead of five. That's when we start to see who are you really and are you capable of being able to understand the concept of minimal effective dose as opposed to just as much as humanly possible when it comes to training and as little as possible with food. We know where that recipe takes us. We've seen that movie multiple times before and it doesn't lead anybody to any, any green pastures. So I think what you just described that evolution is what I really encourage a lot of my clients to do. And what I encourage anybody listening to do is just think about it this way. The longer time horizon you give yourself with all this stuff, you're going to evolve and all this stuff that feels like it's really heavy and sucks and, and just doesn't really agree with you now it's not even going to be a consideration five, 10 years from now. You're just not going to give a fuck anymore. Like Jimmy had a post today <laughs> about just like, why do we care so much? Like, why do we care about all this stuff, all this fluff that we have in our heads about what do other people think about us? Why does our body have to look a certain way? Why do I have to make enough money to placate to the neighbors or to these people? What you realize over time is that you end up creating really solid boundaries around the things that you really hold dear to you and nothing else matters. The noise doesn't creep in anymore. And that's when you can really, I think, confidently say, I finally have gotten to a point where I can pick any direction that I want. 
and I know exactly how to get there. And just being in the pro, like to me, it's like all about. I'm at the point. It's all about the process of getting there. Mm -hmm. I just don't give a shit about goals anymore. The goal is for me <laughs> is to enjoy doing what I'm doing. Like exactly. even Gary Vaynerchuk talks about, you know, he yeah. wants to buy the Jets. He's like, and I hope I never buy the Jets <laughs> because the thing that gives me drive and passion for life is the process of trying to buy the Jets. If I buy the Jets, then I'm going to be like, what the fuck am I going to do now? What do I do now? Yeah. yeah. And it's like like all the stuff that, that you're describing and even like the, the, the one topic that, that you were saying too that connects to this exactly is – I want people to, I want it to look like I work out. This mm. is something else that people yeah. struggle with. And this is in the group that I'm in now I've, I've one uh, woman in the group who that's her big struggle is like, I feel like I don't look like I work out and she's unpacking a lot of stuff and really yeah. starting to recognize, wow, I've come such a long way. Five years ago, I would have killed for the body I have now that I'm not happy with. Yep. And just, it's such a wild thing to think about how we just get we, we the goal becomes such a focus that we are not enjoying anything nope. in life. We're going to the gym solely for the goal, but yeah. to get to that place of like, I'm going to the gym because I like going to the gym. Yeah. I, I just like enjoy it. It's just cool to yeah. be in there. It's cool to bullshit with a couple of folks that I see in there yeah. at the same time. If I go it's in like there and I don't feel like going heavy, I don't go heavy. I could just get yeah. on the treadmill and run. I don't give a fuck anymore. Yeah. And after years of working hard, you don't have to work so hard. That's the greatest thing. Like, I mean, I've, I mean, Rob, yeah. I haven't, I've worked out maybe three or four times in the last four plus months. Man. I just haven't okay. done it. It yeah, but you're doing you're doing crazy. you're doing some heavy lift. You're doing, doing heavy lifting up yes. here, right? Yeah, and it's like I feel great. I feel great. I'm totally fine with it. I'm not beating myself up about it. I still feel fine. Um, but it's well, just, and, this and is, if anybody this is the if anybody needs an ex is. if anybody needs an example of what happens when you've put the work in for years of habitually building those habits, yeah. like look at Jimmy. Like like from, just from a, like, let's just say from an aesthetic standpoint, people always want to like fine. they're afraid that they're going to lose their results overnight. Like this guy hasn't actually trained with any meaningful level of intensity or stimulus in months. And he hasn't really, I, I would lost, say you've, I've lost you've, some aesthetics. No, but you, but, but you, you also haven't had a massive amount of compliance towards correct. your nutrition either. So like, yeah. here's a perfect example of what happens when the underlying behavior is already there. Yeah. And then when you fall, the floor is just much higher. Must be nice. Facts. That's yeah. I, I, I love everything that you're talking about. And um, what I'm recognizing is I, I want to share what can be something that's actually like what you can actually do about that. Uh, because it's easy. I, I just had conversation with, I think, three different clients about this, like in the same that's way. The collective conscious. Everybody's oh, man. Dealing with, if one person's dealing with something, multiple people are dealing with it. And that's why, yeah. like, I love your post because you'll just, you, you can tell when you're in the car or something like that, you just have this thought. You're like, yeah. I'm just going to talk about this. And you I'm know sure. other people are dealing with it if you're dealing with it. So, yeah. yeah. Well, that's a side note. That's also one of the reasons why with my one-on-one -on -one clients, and I, I keep what I consider to be a fairly small roster. Like, I don't, I, I have, I think, 21 clients, I think, right now. Uh, and something that I realized near the beginning of this year is that I have these one-on-one -on -one clients and they're all operating in isolation of each other. So I would talk to one. And then when I get on a call with the other one, while Same maintaining, time. yeah, while maintaining confidentiality and, and all that stuff, because I take that extremely seriously, um, I would say like, hey, I just want to let you know, like, you're not alone. Um, you know, I wish you could talk to so-and-so, or I wish you could talk to this person because I'm just going to tell you, like, you're not alone this. And all of a sudden I was like, why have I not put all of these people? So I just put them all in a, in one community so yeah. they could at least talk How to each great. other. And that's what I'm know. loving about this group that I'm doing right now. It's like, yeah. they, the, the conversation that they have with each other is probably the best part. Yeah. That, Seeing um, other people in the same boat. It's great. Yeah, big time. I took it was actually a, a takeaway a while back from something that Brene Brown had talked about where she talked about like, if you want to really create like, I think she called it like the petri dish of shame, op, let something operate in isolation, and you will see that shame grow. Yeah. And I was like, because people were feeling like they were less than because it was yeah. like, well, I guess I'm the only one who's not getting results right now. I was like, one, you are getting results. We'll talk about that separately. Two, 
no, you're not the only one who feels that way. Um, <laughs> but one of the things that, um, that I've found to be pretty helpful as we're working through with clients on um, getting an understanding for where their beliefs are coming from with, you know, I want to look like I work out. I feel like I should look better for the amount of time that I put into this and how long I've been focusing on this and all that stuff. As we're unpacking that, one of the earliest exercises that I, I try to do pretty consistently with folks, as long as they're open to it, is just create a Google Doc. I just create a Google Doc, send them the link, and it just... Uh, for most of them, I just title it like the fittest version of me. And there's just three spaces. And one is like fittest version of me looks like, feels like, is able to do. And I'm like, this is going to be a forever living document. I don't own this document. I don't write anything on this document. All I do is read it. So anytime that you have these thoughts about like, you know, when like a uh, something that I'm working towards is I want to be able to like, I had one client who very transparently was like, I want to be able to have noticeable visible abs when I'm standing relaxed. She's like, I know that's unrealistic. I'm like, I'm not here to tell you what's realistic and what's not write it down and put a date on it. Like put the date that you thought it. Then another one that she had was I want to be able to on a whim, just run a 5k. I'm like, cool, that goes under the is able to do. Just put that down. So it's this forever, literally a forever living document. So when you talk about goals, Jimmy, and and kind of this thought process of like, man, sometimes it's like, can we throw away the whole like, I got to hit this goal thing and just start to work on the process? I go back and forth with that. And I don't even know if back and forth is the right term to use. At the end of the day, like people are in, in the business world, like people are paying for a result of some sort. Right. Always. And it's easy for us to have these conversations where we're like, hey, you got to like trust the process, which I've evolved more to like trust yourself to execute the process, not just the process itself. Yeah. But finding wins along the way is is cool. And also we're all pretty good with words. We could wordsmith people into just constantly like being on a hamster wheel of just working on things. And then at some point, when are we actually helping them identify hey, did you realize you are now able to, at just the drop of a hat, go run a 5K with your husband and you really enjoyed that? Did you realize, this was a personal one of mine, did you realize that you were able to help your parents move a few hundred pound piece of furniture without a problem? And 10 years ago, dude, you could not have done that at all. You would have been winded and not able to do that. Put that down on the list. So keeping track of those things, I think you still got to give people some tangible things to attach yeah. to that they can relate to the process as they go. It'd be interesting if you added a column of the fittest version of me thinks like. Feedback taken. You know what I mean? <laughs> Just to be like, what is that version of you? How do they think about yeah. their day-to-day -day living and all that kind of stuff? It was a conversation I had today with somebody who's in yeah. the group who we, you know, they, they have the negative body image time because this is another form of actual progress. You have the negative, which nobody I feel like recognizes. You have the negative feelings and then we know that those feelings pass and then you start to feel good about your body. And then it's like, then the negative feelings come again. And so this person was having a really positive feeling day. And then it's like, she said, but it's just frustrating knowing that this is going to pass because the last conversation was about a negative uh, body image day. Yeah. And it's start to take notice of how long those negative body image periods of time last and how long the positive images last. And if those negative images went from, I felt like this for two weeks, I only felt like this for a week before I started feeling better. I only felt like this for a few days. This is progress. You know, so you can actually track even the way that you're thinking about yourself, um, which is interesting. I feel like most people don't. They just focus so much on, I feel like shit about my body again and not recognizing that they're actually making progress with the way they view themselves. Ooh, so true. It reminds me of, you know, like how in factories they'll have the like, it's been 98 <laughs> days since our last accident. Which sort gets of thing. scary. I want to be there when it says it's been two days. <laughs> <laughs> right. We're like, so that's why this like, position is open. Gotcha. Yeah, like go skydiving yeah. the day after somebody dies skydiving. Because that's oh, going to be probably the safest day. Yeah. So it's, I yeah, think, you're not going to double down on solid. death. Yeah. 
<laughs> it's been six years since anybody since anybody's shoot hasn't opened. Maybe I should wait. Before yeah, but, yeah. But, but when it comes to nutrition right. and training, like there there is no there's no real fuck ups. Like people always view these things as like these mistakes that they've made. I overate. Okay, yeah, you're human. They're going or, to happen, so therefore, it's I, I, fuck up. It's, I didn't yeah. train that hard today. Okay, yeah, that's going to occur. Multi, like the longer you do something for, the more margin of error you're going to have. That's just life and anything. If you spend time in a relationship, you're going to fuck up at some point. If you parent kids long enough, you're probably going to fucking say something stupid to them, and then they're going to get yelled, and then they're going to start <laughs> saying something stupid. Every and then, day. Right? So it's like... <laughs> But I think people always, they're so focused on the acute feeling that they have of disappointment as opposed to just awareness around the fact that like it, the people that are in this and are truly fit and whatever you want to define that as are the ones who make all those same mistakes, but then they right. just go right back to taking the actions that they know. And you just accept they're proud of. part of it. There, there's yeah. nothing better to me than the parable of the Chinese farmer. I know JK knows it. You know the you know the parable. Of the Is Chinese this the farmer. bamboo tree? No, Aram, no. Do you know it? School me. I'm about yeah. to find out. Oh, the parable of the Chinese farmer. He uh, Chinese farmer, whatever. Um, Can we make him Russian? I, sure. Uh, the parable of the Russian farmer. He has a uh, he has you know horses or a horse. The horse runs away, and the the neighbors and the people are like, oh, that's horrible that your horse ran away. Like that's a source of income and this and that. And he goes. It could be good. It could be bad. Like it is what it is. Hmm. And then a few days later, a week later, the horse comes back with like five to 10, whatever it is in the parable, wild horses. And all the neighbors are like, oh my God, that's so awesome. You have now all these horses. This is amazing. And he's like, it is what it is. It could be good. It could be bad. So then the son is training the wild horses to try to get them calm. And one of the horses throws him off and breaks his arm or breaks his leg. Neighbors. Oh my God, it's so horrible that this happened to your son. It is what it is. The military comes through because they're going to war and they're recruiting young people for battle. He can't go because he has a broken leg. Oh, you're so lucky that your son didn't have to go because he has the broken leg. Like, it is what it is. And, it, yeah. and that's, that's the parable. I mean, <laughs> everything good, it is what it is. If it's bad, it is what it is. You know, and just when you start to wrap your head around that, all these things that are so horrible, people are like, I'm so sorry. It's like, it is what it is. Yeah. It, it's it it's acute. Never happened to you. It's acutely bad or it's acutely good. It and that's feels all your bad. Yeah, yeah. Right now it does. Yeah. But then what felt horrible five years ago when I was going through it is laughable to me now. It is yeah. an absolutely massive lesson in my life that's perpetuated yes. me to be who I am today. Like, yeah. which it is never a... sticks. It never sticks around. Yeah, which is a sign, even what you identified right there, like what I'm going through now, or what I went through Tell five years ago, me. now I look back on it, it's like, oh, well, actually, I'm in better condition, like I'm able to withstand that much better now, and helping people from a coaching perspective, helping people to identify that is really yeah. big, because especially like in my world, I'll have people who may have particular injuries that tend to flare back up again at mm -hmm. some point. And, um, I'm working through this with a particular individual right now and, um, uh, going back to even talking about what some folks will talk with you about on the intake versus what you then learn. This is something that they definitely did not share with me at all <laughs> that they, had, <laughs> that they had going, this is very common too. So very common. they, they didn't share with me at all that this was a particular thing that tends to flare up from time to time. So of course me, um, I'm. You know, I'm still in that mode that I was 10 years ago when I first started sometimes where I was like, oh, snap, let me go back through their program and figure out what did I do that that may have caused yeah. this issue, that sort of a yeah. thing. And they're like, actually, I may have forgotten to tell you that this typically <laughs> flares up um, all the time. <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah, this typically flares up. That would have been helpful. All the time. And what we were able to identify, they were processing it as, well, here I am again, just like I was last year, same injury, same thing. I was like, okay, that's that's interesting that you look at it that way. Can I present you with a little bit of a reframe here that you're in a better position to recover from that? And actually, you've actually reported that the pain level is like a three out of 10, whereas before it would immediately be an eight out of 10 and also you're well-equipped. And what did you do last time this happened? And I already knew the answer to this question. I was like, what'd you do last time this happened? And they did the classic, like, well, you know, since I can't do this, I'm not just not going to do anything. And then I'm yeah. going to go face first into my pantry and that sort of thing. I was like, huh, interesting. 
because you you told me what are you planning to do this time they're like oh well i'm just going to work around it and then uh, i've still got the like the dietary choices that i'm making and oh i guess that is progress it's like welcome to to use you guys' phrase like welcome to the other side yeah. where stuff happens and we keep rolling like we're we're never super high and we're never super low it's primarily neutral it's just mm -hmm. it is the next step that's where yeah. we go yeah, yeah. And it's just like enjoying like in, in, like soak in those moments when you're in a really good place soak yeah. them in and yeah, take advantage bad, of them yeah when you're in a bad place you, you you just have to almost remind yourself and talk to yourself and be like this i'm going to be thanking myself later for this struggle right now you know and it's hard. this is going to happen. Like this is part of the process of life. This is going to happen. So why am I going to beat myself up over it? But that's the beauty of having a coach is that mm -hmm. exact thing. Like that person could have gone their whole life, not recognizing the improvement they made. And if you're listening, everything that JK has been saying, he's just asking them questions. Hundred. <laughs> that's all it is. Dang it, you just, you just gave away good, my whole model. Yeah. Thanks. That's gave what it a good away. coach does is like you ask questions and it's time it's to funny, drop your you, prices. Yeah, you learn you learn these things too along the way. Like I remember yep. before, like if somebody told me how much they weighed that morning, and I'd be like, "Oh, that's awesome," and then like they were upset about it. So now I've learned I don't ever celebrate anything. I just say, <laughs> "How did you feel about that?" Yeah. <laughs> and then, and then exactly. I respond, and then I go from there. How'd you? Oh, I, I felt I don't know. I didn't feel that like great about it. Well, how, do, how about this? How about this? you just ask questions? And this goes back to. I feel we all have the answers. We just need somebody sometimes to help pull us, pull it out of us or to, to remind us about it. So that's just an amazing example of somebody who's making all this progress and without you, they might not have noticed. Yeah. Like I that, think that, that, I think that sometimes what the, for lack of a better way to put it, like sometimes the dark side of what I call like neutral thinking like that though, especially from a coaching standpoint is when you're working with somebody who is driven by, um, recognition. So the example that I use is like, um, within like the retail space, like you have two different employees, one employee, when they do something great, they want it shouted from the rooftops and announced over the, the loudspeaker. The other employee won't even tell you about it. They would rather they're just like your old school head down, do the work. And my work speaks for itself. Right. So sometimes if you've, for me, when I've got that client who I can tell is the type of personality that is driven by say, like, they have that, that people pleaser piece, uh, the piece where, you know, they want to be like, they like to come home and put the paper on the fridge to show the grade that they got. What I will do, because I'm, I'm not gonna early in my, my coaching career, I definitely was, um, somebody who leaned more towards like, this is my coaching style, take it or leave it. I do not change. Like, this is my personality. Either you like it or you don't. And while I still feel very secure in who I am, what I've understood is that I also will probably do better in this business and feel better attached to my values if I actually adapt to get the best out of my client. So if I've got somebody who's really motivated by that sort of a thing, what I'll do is when they, they, they identify something that they're super stoked about, like a weigh in or they, you know, send in progress photos and it's like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this, like that sort of a thing. Then one, I want to recognize their level of excitement about the thing and then ask them. So if somebody were to like eavesdrop on this conversation right now or this text message thread right now, and they would say, hey, what did you do? Like, what have you been doing consistently that led to that? What would you say? And so that's that then links back to the whole conversation around like trust yourself to execute the process versus like, you know, me doing the exact opposite, which would be like, oh, okay, yeah, that's cool. I, I can see why you're really excited about that. Cool. Okay. And then moving on. I can I'm, see why you're excited about that. Anyway, uh, this week's programming. Um... Yeah. I'm not going to, you know, I've, We're, I've grown. I've grown dropping by 300 calories this week because of how excited you are. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's that's just something I I did want to did want to bring up because I think that a, a good coach will understand um, or work to try and understand like what their client is really driven by, and you can still hold on to like your personality and who you are and what really drives you, while also making sure that you understand like what sort of reward system works for your your client. Yeah, yeah, and and, and we all come from such varying backgrounds, and I think the people that we deal with. Um, 
and I shouldn't even say deal with that's bad language. The people that we work with, uh, mm. they're, they're not going to come from our walk of life and we're not going to always agree, or maybe we don't celebrate the same shit that our clients celebrate. And that, but that like should fest- not like Festivus. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Definitely like Festivus. <laughs> Maybe, I mean, and I grew up in a household where like we didn't celebrate shit. Like we didn't celebrate achievements. We didn't cry about losses. Like it was a very neutral well, household uh, Rob, most of be, the time. To be fair, you'd, you would have had to have had achievements. Oh, Correct. Well, I, stay, I survived. Celebrate. Let's put, let's put it, let's put it that way. I survived. I survived the Soviet regime. What the fuck did you do in cushy New Jersey? <laughs> that Fucking is pussy. There is no comeback from that. Like yeah. I survived yeah. the Soviet go out, go out, go out, go out and sun your nutsack in your fucking private yard. Well, I was having to s- fucking breathe in smokestacks every single day and get whipped by how, a fucking how old Gestapo you officer. Here? I was five. Okay. Just yeah. wanted to point that out. I, when I say the JK, Soviet regime, I, I met my father. <laughs> yeah. JK, if you didn't know, we make sure that every episode, the people find out that it robs from Russia. Yeah, I'm, uh, a national, uh, I'm a na- I'm a nationalist. nationalist. I am a fairly regular listener of the podcast. Fairly, I'm regular. a national. So, so I, I would say our tally is pretty close to each episode. It gets referenced at least once. Yeah, yeah. Like this is not new news to me. So yeah, yeah. I'd say <laughs> yeah. I'd say that's the case. Pick, yeah. pick any episode, listen to it. You will find out one thing, guaranteed. Yeah, yeah that's fair. Yep. Mother, mother, father, Russia. <laughs> I survived the regime. How old were you when you were five? five. Uh, my father actually survived. It. No, but you no. I survived my father's regime, what, which yeah. is essentially he's, just an, he's a, describing like, his father as the regime. an extension yeah. an extension of the Soviet army, essentially, just uh, in his own way without the organizational features. You survived a father who survived the regime. He there's was very no, much. He, no I don't think he he thrived in the regime. He didn't survive. He did fucking great during the regime. It was he when was he the tried only. To leave it, and they said you can have yeah. two hundred dollars. Go away. Five yeah, they're like, just whatever. fuck off. Whatever. We don't want you anymore. If you don't want us, we don't want you. We're taking away your passport. Yeah, J.K. What was the biggest regime you survived growing up? Oh my lord! <laughs> You're talking to a guy who grew up uh, in like four different states, three different countries here. So whoa, what countries? what countries? Yeah, uh, Singapore and Malaysia. So I grew up, okay. uh, yeah. So my, what, second through sixth grade was in Southeast Asia. So like that formative. Military? Holy shit. Was, no, uh, my dad worked for Eastman Kodak back when people actually processed their photos. No oh, shit. So, That's cool. Yeah. So he was, um, yeah, he was a, he was really a big, a big customer relationship guy. So that was his thing. So basically he was responsible for maintaining positive partnerships with basically like the top five contributors to Eastman Kodak's uh, profits. That was his, his thing. So they, yeah, I'm super proud of him. Like they legit basically created a position to make sure that their top five companies that they dealt with were super happy. So he, yeah, at some point that required him living in Southeast Asia. So that's where we went. Apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. I do not speak the language at all. No, because so they ignorant? were. Why are you so ignorant? I know. I'm. I'm definitely <laughs> like super close minded. Um, don't really appreciate listening to opposing opinions and very <laughs> like very. I'm easy to predict. You know. Super. Was that you? Was that you up on the roof the other day? Is that too soon? Oh, is that Lord. too soon? It's it's definitely too soon for some segment of the population here. <laughs> his brain his brain is still in his head, so it was not him. Yeah, room. it's it's too soon for some segment of the population. I love how they and said that. They, luckily, I love how they, I love how they luckily, said they shot him in twenty eight seconds or whatever it was. It was such a precise number. Like, well, he was dead in twenty six seconds. Yeah, luckily, we recorded this two months ago, so it's not too soon anymore. <laughs> <laughs> that's <laughs> that's fair. I will say that those experiences, though. Um, just in being around a lot of different people and especially, you know, straight up to be like as transparent as I want to be being in environments where there were very few people that externally I was like, Oh, okay. Those are people I should hang out with. Like nobody, well, let me not say nobody, the large percentage of the people that were around me that I could interact with didn't look like me, didn't talk like me and didn't walk like me. Was it pretty so, accept- was they accepting of you though? Yeah. From an, uh, yeah. In accepting. General? Yeah, accepting. Yeah. yeah. Now, those two countries um, at some point were British Commonwealth. So that's why 
they're a yeah. large English speaking population. I went to an international school, you know, all that stuff. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't until like years later that I did realize some of the stuff that was going on. Like when I would walk through, um, when we would go shopping and we walked through like an open air market, I would like openly have like people who were just grabbing my hair just to pull it, just to be like, Oh, that's interesting. Like that sort of a thing. <laughs> The stuff that like if they did that to one of my kids right now, like that, that would be a problem. Um, I didn't necessarily realize like how jacked up that was at the time. Um, and just growing up in environments where in order to actually thrive, you would you would need to get out of your comfort zone and interact and understand where other people were from. And what they were all about if you wanted to have any sort of like if I wanted to have friends and I only wanted to have friends who looked like me and were from where I was from, I was going to be a loner that that's what was going to happen. So it was for me, it was a big culture shock coming back to the States in seventh grade when I come back to a high school and I go to up, a high school in upstate New York or middle school in upstate New York and it's very like segmented, like yeah. the lunch tables, everybody's like, yeah, like, the, like only certain like people sit together. Girls. Yeah. They you've got the jocks. The cafeteria. Yeah. yeah. And so I was always like, I was the social butterfly because I was just like, I didn't know any better. Yeah. So, you know, some of my friends would be like, you know, we're hanging out after school, you know, over on the field, do you want to hang out? And so I'd be out there. I'm like, well, they're like, why'd you bring these people with you? I'm like, what, what are you talking about? These people. I, I don't know. Yeah, I didn't know. I didn't yeah. know that was a thing. So I've never, yeah, I've never really fit into that. So it's definitely benefited me from, from the work that I do now, just because I'm not, I don't think that anybody has to necessarily, that's where my whole mantra of like, you don't have to fit into a box. It's just, can we at least get an understanding of what has formed that foundation so far? And that's a constant work in progress. And then we'll build from there. So just acknowledge like, these are the beliefs that I have. These are where these beliefs come from. And then we can build up. It's just, it's weird to me that so many people just assume that if they admit or recognize, like, yeah, I have these particular beliefs, that that means that is now the box you're in. Mm. Like, it's just, I still find that to be fairly odd. Yeah. You mean multiple things can be true at the same time? I know it's, it, I'm telling you, behavioral therapy, I'm telling you, it is, uh, it seems to be, people are very suspect. They're like super suspect. How old is JK? He just said suspect instead of sus, like the young boys. <laughs> I am in my mid forties. What know. am I? 45, 46, somewhere around there. Yeah. JK's son has a podcast too. Look does he really? Just, he he does. Uh, I believe that he's only pausing it right now. I think he's only on he pause. He ended season one. He's, he ended season one. <laughs> Dude, I don't know. He's he's a. Uh, Have you listened to it? 13? He's about to be 12, 12 okay. at the end of uh, at the end of yeah, August. So our boys are the same age. Yeah, mine, yeah, be, yeah. Like him and Hendricks same October. age. Yeah, yeah. It's called it, it's called Kids Talk Sports with Mason. No shit, and, really. Yeah, That's yeah, awesome. man. I'm. Super proud of him. He he uh, kept it going for over a year, like wow. without fail, yeah. once a week over a year. He hit he hit over twenty thousand listens, and I was like, "You don't understand how big we that haven't is, even man. hit that." I don't think we hit that. Yeah. <laughs> hey, you should lie. Anyways, but yeah, um, yeah. Per it's, episode, it's we might be pretty similar. <laughs> I, I I don't doubt it. Uh, J.K., how many Zig Ziglar books have you read? <laughs> Dude, who who i was just gonna for, try and pretend i didn't know who that was i know uh, you know who he is i've read at least oh, Rob, do you know zig ziglar at least i two. do i don't pay attention yeah at least not, be, not because That's, i don't think it's any good i just i i'm very bad at reading any that stuff any still remains true it's a hundred percent it's it's sales stuff like when i was working for la fitness and i became the assistant manager of like the sales department it was I got the Zig Ziglar book. It was a red cover. Actually, it's read Zig Ziglar's oh Secret gosh. of Closing the Sale. Of Secrets Closing, of closing the, sale. the Sale. But it's all about, I mean, it really is. It's all about actually, and you had said before, genuinely caring about the customer and that you are providing help and solution to them. It's not this manipulative stuff. But what you were talking about always being part of sales. I was yeah. thinking about that. I'm like, he had to have read a Zig Ziglar, especially if your dad was involved with that stuff too. 
Yeah, he handed. Oh my gosh, he handed down so much, so much stuff, and a lot of my understanding or my my belief system in um, how to shift and move in different spaces and environments, one hundred percent comes from him and my grandfather. Like it, yeah. it totally, totally comes from them because the the goal is always I can I can. I could survive and thrive in just about any environment long enough to like figure out what's going on. And then I'm going to make my move and figure out what we yeah. need to do here in order to get this. The careful, the careful observer. Was, mm-hmm. the tra- was the trauma of the uh, Southeast Asians touching your hair what caused you to shave your head? <laughs> no, <laughs> no. That's just age. On? <laughs> yeah, that's just age. I just figured like the whole George Jefferson thing probably wasn't going to be a whole, you know, it wasn't going to be a real big chick magnet. And I, so uh, I went ahead and got that taken care of. And lo and behold, my wife was like, yeah, I feel like this. I so. feel like every one of our podcast episodes is just this exact same picture. I feel like we need to get a picture of you with hair and no beard. And just that's there's not oh even a title. Of the episode. It's just that's the cover. You with hair and no beard. I'm pretty sure there's a um, an old picture when I was like 12 with like a a Steve. I I, I was Steve Urkel before Steve Urkel was a thing. Oh my like god, 100. percent Like even yeah. when Steve Urkel blew up, when Family Matters blew up, I think I was in high school, and legit friends in high school were like, "How did they nail that character so perfectly?" Because that is you. I so mean, I, I feel so next- old. So next year for the Real Coaches Summit on the name badges, what we'll do is we'll have everybody submit their worst teenage picture. That, that would and be then hilarious. That we'll, put, we'll put that on your on your name badge for you. I would actually, would actually be totally awesome. down with that. Yeah, like a yearbook. Like the That'd yearbook be so fucking funny. Submit, like, that is a great picture. idea. Every attendant has to send a picture of them yep. Holy cow. from <laughs> high school or younger. And then there's just a slideshow going during – the happy during, hour during the meals, yeah, and it just has their Instagram epic. handle. That is and then and we could do like a we could do a raffle if you can guess who that is. That is perfect, or the presenters oh, at least, at like least. a raffle. Yeah, that that would be perfect. I'd be down with that. <laughs> yeah. Oh God! Yeah. How great would that be? A yearbook. I look like a video, I, video. I look like a fat carrot top when I was a kid. <laughs> fat carrot top. We gotta send you gotta send us a picture. The, I think the youngest pictures I've seen of you are when uh, maybe like the like when you were did the modeling thing when you cut for the one photo shoot. Oh god, I mean that was 2015. That's like yesterday. Yeah. No, I was yeah. There's there's a picture of me standing next to a clown when I was like eight when I invited a bunch of people to my birthday party and nobody showed up and it was just me, the clown, and my mom and it was the most awkward terrifying picture of my life and it, that that shaped a lot of my dysfunction today was it like when the clown brought you into the back room and your mom wasn't around it was it had nothing to do with it was the fact that i had invited like 35 people to a <laughs> birthday party for my school and like a bunch of people rsvp that they would come and on the day of i think like three people showed up oh, and that's snap. what i that's a, that was the day that i was introduced to disappointment anger that's what you and then that just that anger and that resentment. disappointment just carried on forever, and then I would pass that disappointment on to all the people I would interact with ever since. Oh, then. Wow! So At least I recognize like the direct yeah. line. Yeah. No, I've That's been good. I've been offloading disappointment now for forty years. That's healthy. Yeah. <laughs> That's healthy. I think by the time I'm like 60, 70, I should I should be free of all my baggage. That's when you'll finally throw another birthday party. Yeah, I'll be like, okay, I'm confident that if I if nope. I build it, they will come. That explains why you are why you started the Real Coaches Summit. Yeah, I wanted people to show up to my party finally. Yeah, look yeah. at you. Yeah, thirty five people didn't come, and now hundreds come. I know. Yeah. yeah, I can make two hundred and fifty people come. I was waiting for something like that. <laughs> Is there a better way to end an episode than that? I don't know. I don't know, J.K. We might no. have to have you back. I feel like. Uh, you're just full of uh, wisdom nuggets, and I just love the calm delivery <laughs> of your message. You are, uh, yeah, like the most intense and calm person combination. Uh, make sure you guys are following him on Instagram. He gives great nuggets for training. You'll get to see his mid thigh shorts and no show socks. Oh yeah, fantastic God. legs. That is Fantastic so good. legs. Hoochie Daddy shorts all day. That's where it's at. 
my so wife is good. a little con- my wife gets a little confused though because I have a I have an 18 year old daughter and she's like you know I'm starting to get a little concerned that I can't tell the difference between your shorts and hers. And like, <laughs> oh my god! I don't know what to tell you. She's folding them and she's like. <laughs> No, no lie. Which like sometimes, yeah, yeah. Sometimes does yours say, she'll, does yours she'll say she'll juicy on the ass? <laughs> no, no, and neither do my daughters. Okay, good. I would hope not. No. I was gonna say you don't seem like the kind of father that would that would allow that to occur. The- no, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly more um, hands off. Isn't the right word. I would hope. Yeah, so. hands off is the right word. No, roots and wings. That's like the parenting philosophy. You you build as many, build the roots as deep as you can, and then you gotta let them fly. Yeah. So yeah. she's getting ready to go to college. Uh, in Where's she going? Later, so, University of Alabama. Roll Tide. Oh, shit. Damn. Yeah. Roll well, Tide. This will, this will be easier to get a football ticket. You would think, and no, <laughs> it's not. <laughs> no, it's not. Even for for parents of children. Oh, for her, yeah, for her, it's all good. But yeah. uh, unless she decides to somehow get on the football team, that's probably not going to happen. So, yeah, yeah. But my well, my parents live about uh, about seventy five miles from the campus. So, oh no, shit, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. So it's she'll have be, some family. Looking forward to it. Relatively close. Yeah. Yeah, close enough and far enough away. Perfect. Like I'm really looking forward to her her flying. She's gonna be f- fine. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. I, I appreciate mean, you guys having me on yeah. big time. Thank yeah, you for coming on. I appreciate it. Good conversation. I think there was a lot of poignant things yeah. said, and hopefully they were net helpful. And uh, yeah, obviously we're all gonna lower our prices together now and collectively make the coaching industry better. <laughs> I Jay. did not co-sign to that, so I don't pay attention. <laughs> I do not pay attention to what Walmart's doing. So yeah, I'm going to be I'm hiring JK that. when I have to get my life back together again with training. Amen. Um, I'm here. The only guest ever in the history of the show that probably knows our final question. <laughs> I do, so you can say bye now. I'm totally fine. <laughs> yeah. We ask this question to every guest to compare them and judge them. <laughs> Why do you even bother at this point? Why do, by the way, why do you have people who, who will be like, yeah, I listen to the show and then clearly and then they don't know because well, they, well yeah. then we, A, we catch them in a lie, which they means that we don't have to, to we don't have, or they, they don't, don't listen have to the end. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe well, the yeah. amount of people, we have had a handful of people that are like, yeah, but then it just like cuts off. 